Praise be our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ. Now and always and I had a friend from Rhode Island who was a, a, a classmate in seminary. <clears throat> and uh, before he was at the seminary that we were at in Boston, uh, he was from Rhode Island. He used to visit a Benedictine abbey called Portsmouth Abbey in Portsmouth, Rhode Island. And he got to be good friends with the, with the abbot, who was kind of a smart alecky fellow, you know. He was talking to him, and he saw one of the monks sort of leaning out the window. And the abbot said, yes, among us, that is called contemplation. And then he asked him what it was like to be abbot of the monastery, having such an important job of being a le- leader. And he said, well, he said, I too am a man under authority, he said. I say to one of the monks, go, and perhaps he goes. And I say to one of the monks, come, and perhaps he comes. And that's the reality of authority, anyway. Unlike the centurion, I say to one, go, and he goes, the other, mm-mm, you know. You ask somebody to do something, and supposedly you're in charge. That person is going to be free and make up their own mind anyway, for the most part. That's the way it is in the world, because we have this in- innate sense of freedom and autonomy that God put into us for a purpose. The purpose is so that we can direct our lives by a free choice toward Him, toward God. But the sin of the age, we can't come up with anything any newer than Adam and Eve. The sin of the age is disobedience, in a sense that we have greater autonomy than we actually do, that we have more control over our lives than we actually do. The fact is that God is in charge. And none of us was born a day before God, and none of us is twice as smart. So it's a good thing that God is in charge. But we forget that. We would rather think that we are in charge, that we make absolutely free choices. But we don't. The fact is we're already on a path of one kind or another. We're serving somebody and not serving somebody else. Those of us of a certain age can remember, you know, Bob Dylan's song, you know, got to serve somebody. And we do. Like it or not, we're serving somebody and are free of somebody else. We're serving something and we're free of other things. That's just the way it is. And every life is a sort of constellation of what it is that we serve and what it is that we do not serve. I said that the sin of our age is the same as the sin of Adam and Eve, which is disobedience. But legend has it that it was Satan himself as well, before the creation of the world, who said, Lucifer, I will not serve. Even the the angels would not serve God, some of them. And they ended up on a path that took them to a place altogether, than other, altogether different from what God had in mind for them. How is it that we are supposed to be servants and free at the same time? Well, St. Paul kind of points it out when he's talking to the Romans here. He, said, he starts out with something that we forget often enough. You have been set free from sin, he said. He's not saying you are being set free. You have been set free from sin. We who have been baptized have accepted to be servants of Jesus or have already been set free from sin. Does that mean we stop sinning? No. The flesh is weak. As St. Paul says, you once presented yourselves as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity. So now present your members, the the parts of you, as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. It's a matter of where we show up. Do we show up to please ourselves, to satisfy our own desires, to live out of a sense of autonomy independent of God and of one another? Or do we place ourselves firmly on that road that says we are slaves or servants, if you will? of God and of righteousness. Now there's an important contrast that Paul makes too. While we are slaves of sin, 
we get what we deserve. That's what a wage is, right? You work for a certain period of time, you get paid for it. You sin, you die. The wages of sin is death. And death has entered into the world whether we like it or not. It is a part of every one of our lives. It is more certain than anything else we will ever do. More certain than our next breath. And when it will come, we have no idea. Except for those who want to take the ultimate step of autonomy and independence from God and choose to end their own lives when they want to. And in a sense, when it's not, when it's caused for philosophical reasons or for religious reasons rather than emotional distress or, you know, being mentally ill, that is a big problem. As far as sin and the ultimate destiny to which each one of us is called. The ultimate destiny that each one of us is going to face. The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life. We don't deserve eternal life. It has been given to us. We can't earn it. We don't earn it. It's the free gift of God. We have been, we're already set free from sin so that we can become slaves or servants of righteousness instead. If we're not convinced that we've been set free from sin, we're not going to be set free from sin. But once we become convinced that God has set us free, God, through the sacrifice of his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, has set us free from our sin and has set the Christian community free from sin in order to lead the world into this freedom, freedom to serve in righteousness. One of the examples of that that we get is the story that, uh, that uh, Jesus, uh, of, of what Jesus says to the centurion. Now, the centurion mentions that he's got slaves or servants, and one of them is sick. But the fact is that the centurion is part of the occupying Roman army in Judea. So he's one of the masters, just as the natives, the Jewish people who are there, and the Samaritan people who are there, and the Philistines who are there, are servants or slaves. It's the Romans who are the masters. But he talks about how he deals with with his servant, whom apparently he cares about because he went all the way to talk to Jesus to ask him to heal his servant. And he said, and Jesus said, of course, I'm coming. Okay, no, no, you don't have to come. See, this, this centurion who was a master already understood the mores, the customs, the laws of the Jewish people and knew that a pious Jew is not supposed to enter under the roof of a Gentile. So he said, no, no, you don't have to do that. Just say the word, because that's how authority works, isn't it? If you have authority over sickness and evil and sin and death, then you have authority to heal my servant. And Jesus is amazed at his faith. Never in Israel have I seen such faith. Many will come from east and west and will eat with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob at the kingdom of heaven, while the heirs of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and the gnashing of teeth. And then he says, let it be done for you according to your faith. Okay. Faith is the key that starts the engine. Faith is what it is that enables us to know despite all of our own self-doubt, despite everything that goes wrong in our lives, everything that goes wrong in the world around us, that we have been set free from sin and we are able freely to serve righteousness now. Not to deserve the eternal life that God has given us as a free gift, but out of thanksgiving that we have been given this freedom from sin and we've been given this eternal life of which we also are not always convinced. It is hard to live knowing that you will not die. It is hard to live knowing that your survival is guaranteed because it contradicts the very evidence of our own eyes. That's where faith comes in. Some of you were here when Bishop Louis Pushkash was, was here as bishop. And some of you probably know that of three nephews that he had from his brother Victor, 
all three were ordained deacons. And one of them now is director of the diaconate program in the Diocese of Joliet in Illinois. But the oldest of them, I know, I think he's the oldest, Michael, one day was preaching in his church about being ready for death when it came. And that very night, that very evening, while he was doing as he often did, swimming for exercise, God took him. He died that very night. He was living, in a sense, so lined up, so in tune with the will of God for him, that whether he realized it or not, his last words were, be ready, be ready, be ready. Because this death that we go through in life is something that we all do go through, but whether we go through it in fear and agony, or we go through it in trust and love, that's our choice. That's our choice. You know, I'm going to be going to the Cleveland Clinic this, this week for a, an operation um, on my heart. And anything can happen, as it turns out. The guy that's doing the surgery invented the procedure that he's going to be doing. He's in charge of the Cardiothoracic Surgery Institute, of the whole, that whole building, J Building, if you've ever been there, at the Cleveland Clinic. So I couldn't be in better hands, as the world would think. But the fact is, I can't be in better hands anyway. And no matter what the outcome, I am in God's hands. And so are you. And my survival is guaranteed because of God's free gift of eternal life. And so is yours. So what makes a difference? As I told my cousin, I have a cousin, my mom's first cousin went to school together. They went to school together in, in a little village outside of Târgumuraș. Now, Târgumuraș in Romania is known for its hospitals. And so my mom's first cousin has a daughter, Mariana, who is a doctor. She still lives in Târgumuraș, but her daughter lives in California. So I called her, my cousin Juana, to let her know what was going on at, because I knew Mariana was there. And Mariana, speaking as a physician and as a relative, said, the important thing is you have to trust the doctor. Because if you don't trust the doctor, the doctor is going to know. And it will make a difference. What kind of, who knows? Who knows what, what, what makes a scalpel go one millimeter to the left or to the right that could make all the difference? So you want to give the doctor everything you can by way of trust and confidence. And I thought, you know, Jesus healed the centurion servant. He healed me of my sin. He may heal me of my physical ailment through the work of the doctor and all the nurses and everybody else at the Cleveland Clinic. But if he doesn't, he healed me of my death already. As I live my life, I have to trust not only Dr. Svensson. I have to trust the eternal healer of souls and bodies, the divine healer, Jesus. Trust his Father. Trust his Holy Spirit. Believe that the Holy Trinity is out for our good, not to torture us for a little while and throw us off into the outer darkness. St. Paul says if we're in the outer darkness, or Jesus says if we're in the outer darkness, it's essentially our choice. It's our faith that puts us where God wants us. Trust the doctor, she said. Trust the doctor.